Constitution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for join, uh, tonight for tuning in. Town Hall is sincerely grateful for this opportunity to sustain our program of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when circumstances keep us from doing it together under the same roof. We've amassed quite an online catalog of events over the last 10 months, and honestly, over the five to six years prior, numbering thousands of programs by now in science, civics, and arts and culture. So if you decide Town Hall's the rabbit hole for you, head over to our website, and look for the header digital media, and just start digging. But back to tonight's program, which will last about an hour, uh, I just got a little ahead of myself. It'll last about an hour, including an audience Q&A. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend the stream via our YouTube page uh, linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click on the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player there. Once we get to Q&A, to participate, use the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen here, or if you're watching on YouTube, through that platform's chat field. We can't guarantee we'll be able to address every question, but keep them concise. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming events include a panel discussion with youth activists tomorrow, live from our great hall. Harvard astronomer Avi Loeb uh, on the very first confirmed signs of interstellar visitors to Earth. Stanford ethicist Susan Leotold on how to make ethical choices in an increasingly complicated world. Rob Cheney on the current state of grizzly bear populations in the lower 48. In the first concert in our 2021 Global Rhythms series, that's our world music series, this year devoted to island cultures and featuring the music of Okinawa from Seattle-based artists Mako and Manjuru. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno Matulski Science Lecture Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the Northcliff Foundation, the Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the taxpayers of Washington State. But as most of you know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and so I want to thank all of our members watching tonight. Um, something just happened too. I'm having a rough time with my computer tonight. There we go. Um, as for the rest of you, if you share Town Hall's dedication to a community invigorated by arts and ideas made accessible to as many as possible, we hope you'll consider a membership or even just a contribution as well. And since I'm plugging nonprofits, I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge the extraordinary work of the Institute for Systems Biology, also in the public interest. For more information about their work, visit isbscience.org. All right, on to tonight's program. Dr. Jim Heath is a chemist and the president and professor of the Institute, um, a professor at the Institute of Systems Biology. He is also the position of professor of molecular and medical pharmacology at UCLA, and he has directed the National Cancer Institute funded NSB Cancer Center since 2004. He appears in conversation tonight with Dr. Rod Hockman to consider the question, how will healthcare be different after COVID operationally and medically? Here to get us underway and to introduce you to Dr. Hockman, please welcome Dr. Jim Heath. Thank you, Ware. It's a pleasure to be here um, and to be back at Town Hall. Um, as I hope some of the audience might know, we we hosted and or co-hosted with Town Hall several events this past year, and it's great to kick off 2021 with uh, an exciting event. So um, just a little bit about ISB. We're a nonprofit biomedical research institute in the South Lake Union neighborhood of Seattle. Um, we research some of the most pressing issues in human health uh, with a big program in COVID, programs in cancer, um, MS, brain health, um, and much more. Uh, we also have a very active educational outreach program that impacts um, most of the school districts throughout the Pacific Northwest, including uh, very likely the uh, children of um, many of the listeners who are here tonight. Um, and, and, and we have a particular focus on addressing inclusion and equity for historically underrepresented groups in science. So um, in case you forget where I'm from, you can just look behind me, there it is. And um, you can learn more about our web, about ISB by visiting the website, isbscience.org. Um, and I wanna be sure to, to thank uh, Ware and the rest of the town hall uh, Seattle group who's been just uh, wonderful partners in hosting these ISB town hall events over the past um, actually several years and we hope to have several more coming up this year. Um, so tonight I am um, very excited to have uh, my friend and um, uh, comrade in arms in terms of some things that we do together, uh, Dr. Rod Hogman. Um, so Rod is president and CEO of Providence St. Joseph's Health, 
which is a it's a health network that consists of a lot of employees, 120,000 employees, 51 hospitals all up and down the West Coast, but also in Montana, New Mexico, um, Oregon, Texas. Um, and in fact, ISB is a, a, a proud affiliate of the Providence Healthcare System. And many of the clinical studies that we do here and scientific studies we do here at the ISB, we do in collaboration with Providence Physicians and Hospitals. Um, last year, uh, Modern Healthcare named Rod as one of the 50 most effective clinical executives. Um, but even more impressive, uh, Rod has just assumed the role as the uh, chairman of the board of the American Hospital Association, which is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a really, really big hospital association across the, um, across the continent. Um, so what Rod and I are gonna talk about tonight is basically a little bit on COVID, um, a little bit on the science in COVID, what the world's gonna look like as we emerge out of this pandemic. And, um, and so Rod, I'll just put the first question to you is, you know, everybody's curious about vaccines. Um, I think Providence has done a pretty good job in getting um, their vaccines rolled out, but um, maybe you can just update us on, on sure. what everybody can expect. So we're, we're keeping an eye on, on the national basis as well, and particularly kind of looking and making sure that uh, we're a little more successful now than we were before. Uh, you know, I kind of defined the world into the BC, DC, and AC, before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. Uh, another one would be uh, BT, DT, and AT, before Trump, during Trump, and after Trump. And those three eras really reflect a lot on policy, a lot on how we're going to get, let's talk about vaccination first, since it's top of mind. Uh, I remember about six months ago, I went on the record with American Hospital Association saying, what are we going to do about vaccine? You know, remember six or seven months ago, all we could talk about was PPE, testing, all of that. And I said, if we don't start to get ready for vaccines now, we're not going to be ready. And there was a lot of work being done, as Jim, you're very, very aware of all the work that was done on the science of vaccines and getting that done, which was critically important and probably will change healthcare forever as we go forward. But not as much emphasis on how we deliver it, how do we get it into people's arms. And I said, look, you know, this is 330 million Americans and give or take 4 billion people around the world. That's a big deal. The last time we did that, for some of us in the audience, was about 70 years ago for polio in the United States. But we really haven't thought a lot about mass, mass vaccinations since then. Where do you need to learn about mass vaccination? You learn about it in the developing world because they do it all the time. But you know, there are a lot of folks that just didn't want to think that way. So it's ultimately what was done was we got the vaccine, now we're gonna dump it on the states and then we're gonna allow every county to figure this out. So the present state of vaccine delivery, delivery is chaotic to say the least. Uh, all 50 states are doing it a little bit differently. Yeah, there are CDC recommendations on who should get it first and who should get it second. But on top of that, every county is doing it differently. So we have healthcare in seven states. LA County is doing it completely different than King County. And every state, as we go through the American Hospital Association, is, is doing it a little bit differently. So we are woefully behind. So if you do the math, because it's a lot of a math problem, we need to vaccinate at least 2 million people a day to get us to a reasonable endpoint. 330 million Americans, if we're doing 2 million a day, uh, about uh, 160 days. So that's about five or six months to get that done. We're barely, I think we're at the latest statistics, Jim, we're about seven or 800, we're getting close to a million. And you know, okay. you know, everyone's arguing whether a million is a great number or not, whatever. But what we really do need is, uh, you know, we have a scarcity of vaccine today. Uh, it's not, there's not enough out there. Many of us are, are really hopeful for the J&J &J vaccine that 
I think will be approved probably the second week or so of February. The thing that makes it a game changer is that it's single dose and doesn't require the ultra freezing and you know care that both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine take. But I'll let you uh, opine on that a little bit, Jim. But I, I think we need to have, apparently they'll have 100 million vaccines ready when it's approved. So we're gonna need to really step this up considerably and we're gonna have to have mass vaccination sites that I think should be available 24 seven. The other thing that we talked about on vaccines is, it's not about the vaccine, you gotta sign up for it, and then you gotta document it. So today we're doing it on cards. You know, a lot of us think we should have it on our iPhone, you know, that we've been vaccinated. And then particularly with the Moderna and Pfizer, it's a two-step two vaccine, which makes it, you know, doubly more complicated. But Jim, I, you know, it'd be interesting to hear some of your thoughts on what you think the science of the different vaccines. And, you know, I think for everyone listening to us, uh, what, what your thoughts are in terms of the efficacy of, of, of what's available to us. Well, I think the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are, um, you know, they're, they're definitely 21st century vaccines. It's a, it's a fundamentally different technology. Um, how that vaccine actually functions, how it's even delivered into the body. Um, you get the needle in the shot, but basically the, the, the nanovascular carrier of the, of the mRNA. Um, and it's, a, it's, you know, I think what it um, is going to enable, you know, we showed here, and I think people think that, I'll say a couple of things about the vaccine. So first, there is some thought that, well, back in February, we decided we needed a vaccine and we actually managed to get one made this quickly. Uh, you know, it's not quite that easy. Um, if you go back to the SARS 2002, uh, um, which was not quite a pandemic, but it was a, a major event, that's actually where we learned how we were gonna design the vaccine for uh, SARS um, 2020. Yeah. Our, our, our COVID-19. Um, and so those design rules then, people already started working on making those vaccines, uh, maybe even by late December, certainly early January. Um, yeah. But the advantage of these mRNA vaccines, which are the ones that are available now, is that it's a relatively straightforward modification to evolve those vaccines for a new use. A new, yep. a new, a new viral virus that comes along, um, and you know for sure we've got all these growing pains with distribution centers. Um, you know, it's, it's been as, as Rod pointed out, there's been a an issue of coordination. Um, there's with all the refrigeration needed for some of these, it has made it doubly hard. I think that's really a technology thing that will be overcome um, in the future. It's an issue of it being rushed, but it will be just a normal refrigerator at some point. I think even the Moderna is not minus 70 at least. It's not minus 70, but you know, the, at least the J&J, &J, which is I think adenovirus based, uh, just requires maybe minor refrigeration, but stable. So for clinics and rural areas, and just, you know, when you're setting up these clinics, you know, you're under a race of time to make sure that all the vaccine is used in a perfect world. So I think, and then also being single dose makes a difference. And so far, the numbers that I've seen so far, you know, I talked to the CEO at J&J, &J, they are looking at least 90% plus efficacy of, the, of, the, of their uh, vaccine. So I think that'll be a significant game changer when we have it. And it'll enable us to really open up the sites and be able to do it. The concern that a lot of us have and what we've seen with vaccines is it's getting increasingly difficult for those folks that don't are don't have the technology, elderly that are locked away, folks that have chronic illnesses, that it's not as easy for them to access the clinics to get to where they need to be. And that's what we're hearing a lot of. Uh, in order to do vaccination right, you know, we've got to vaccinate nearly everyone to make this work. And that means, you know, thinking about how do we get to the homeless? How do we get to other populations that are out there that all require? Then we have a number of folks that are 
vaccine afraid. So Tuskegee was one element, particularly for African-Americans, that made them very, very reticent about any sort of vaccine that's supposed to be good for them. We've noticed in our population, we have 120,000 people that work for us. We have vaccinated over 90,000 of them. But we also have a number of our Hispanic Americans that are reticent about it. So what we've said is, let's, let's pause a little bit. Let's give people a chance to see how this vaccine works and then come back around and ask the question again. It's also, we've, we're trying to do a lot of public service announcements in Spanish and with people that can relate to the communities that, that are there. And I think those are all things that, you know, for me as a um, you know, health care professional that looks at large delivery of health system over states and millions of people, those are all the elements that should have been actually thought of a long time ago. And we're, we're catching up to be able to do that. But you know, we want to make sure that the poor and vulnerable populations get as much access as anyone else. You know, we've been talking a lot this year about health equity. It came up amongst the other things during 2020. And health equity starts with ensuring that everyone has access to vaccine. And we have really stepped up and we're really insisting that the systems and things that are in place are there also to get the folks that aren't ordinarily, don't have the kind of access that a number of us have. So that to us has been a big issue as we look at the whole vaccine uh, issues and debates that we have out there. Well, you you touched upon a couple of my favorite topics over the past year. Um, one of them is um, this issue of health equity. One of them is this issue of how do you um, provide basically medical services to people that are remote or ambulatory limited or um, otherwise unable to get to clinics. Um, and that, you know, that's something that we've faced this past year ourselves. We've been doing very large patient studies on um, over the course of the pandemic to try to, you know, really understand what this disease means for not just acute infections, but you know what it's going to mean in the long run, and I think we'll probably touch on that in a little bit. Um, and you know, one challenge that I think has really characterized many clinical studies, um, including you know the way that we would have done ours if we had done it in a traditional way, is that you get a certain patient demographic that comes in and participates, and it's not doesn't represent the demographic that's actually going to be your customers. And this, similar to the situation for vaccines or to healthcare, whatever. Um, and so we've actually de been developing a lot of technologies over the past year to allow us to distribute healthcare away from bricks and mortar systems. Yeah. And that gives you access to patient demographics that you normally couldn't engage in trials. Um, and you know, Providence has been a leader in telemedicine. And so yeah. it doesn't, re and patients like it better. Yep. And so I think that's been, um, you know, now we're not just for COVID, we're looking at some of the cancer trials, the MS trials, et cetera, on how can we design these trials by sending the medical system to the patients? It turns out it's actually cheaper, amazingly enough. It, 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 it's cheaper in certain ways, certain ways it's better. And people have asked me, so in uh, 2019, as a health system, we did 70,000 virtual visits. In 2020, we did 1.7 million virtual visits. So people have asked me as virtual, virtual visits are here to stay. So as we get into this period after COVID, as we're doing it, we're gonna stay with uh, using virtual visits and telehealth, all the things that you said, Jim, but it'll also be in balance with actually touching and seeing patients as well. So it's not one way or the other. It's really the, what we're seeing in the after COVID world is this combination of taking what we learned during COVID and how do we find that balance together so that, you know, we have greater access, you know, we're getting we're really comfortable with all of telehealth that we have. But at times, as, as many of our listeners and 
viewers would say that there's nothing like the human touch. And what have we learned during COVID? The isolation of seniors, right? Where they couldn't be with their families. And as much as being virtually with your family, I'm sorry, it doesn't cut it. Uh, there is something about touching a patient being with a patient, being with a patient's family. But I think if we can use both of these elements, the virtualization with the in touch, we'll have a better health system as we move forward. So I, I think that's one thing that we've really learned. On the administrative side of healthcare, all of my people that do all the billing and do all of that are home doing that work. And the question is, how do they come back? And the answer to that is, is, is that some of it will come back the same with technology companies, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to use some of the techniques and things we've learned from virtualization with some of the things of getting together. It's like, Jim, you and I talked about, there's nothing like doing a strategy session around a whiteboard. That's still really hard to do virtually. But there are other things that can bring us together that we can use all the virtual tools. Virtual psychiatry has really blossomed during this whole event. One of the things that we've been most concerned about during COVID is the mental stress on both people, society, but also on our caregivers who have been, you know, we just marked the one year anniversary of the first COVID case, which was January 20th in Everett, Washington at, at Providence Everett. And now we've gone a full year and we're still into this. We're seeing the stress and strain on the frontline caregivers like we've never seen before. But what we've used is telepsychiatry, telespiritual care, in order for people who are on the front lines to access immediately help and support as they go through. Of our 120,000 people, over 30,000 have accessed some sort of support services. And that's been greatly aided by both digitization and virtualization so we can get the right care to the right person at the right time. But I think those are all examples of as we move into this after COVID period that we're going to profoundly change the delivery of health care like we haven't before. Well, we did, you know, I think all of us did many experiments this last year that, um, you know, we simply wouldn't have done or, or would have been too, um, you know, things that would have been crazily bureaucratic or burdensome to, to do uh, in 2019, we got done in one day in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Just because, yeah. you know, certain things mattered. And, um, you know, some of what you're talking, like, I think probably a couple of years ago, we might have sat here and talked about, you know, the P4 medicine or personalized medicine. But much of what we or learning about is how to personalize medicine. In other words, personalize the actual delivery. And, and uh, you know, there's not certainly not a one size fits all. Um, and there's not a one visit that fits all. I, I, I think that that's correct. But um, but the the balance between, you know, a, a, a the clinic and, and a distribution for us, at least for our scientific studies, um, you know, there, there is a new way to go forward, I think, that we are in, tremendously excited about. And, and I think in, in there's going to be ramifications for, for patients as well. Um, something else I wanted to um, talk about is, you know, over the course, as you said, one year ago, to what, three days ago or something, yeah. was the first COVID patient. And, um, you know, I think from the clinical view, but also from the scientific view, we have learned a staggering amount over the past year. And probably now with, you know, um, trying to distribute a, a virus to the whole globe, we're actually going <laughs> to learn a lot about that side of things as well that we hadn't really thought about before. Um, but, you know, something that struck me, um, and because I just live and breathe it uh, for the past year, is really how little we knew um, or about the deep immunology of a, of a disease like this. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Jim, you and I share a common bond. You know, we, we were interested in immunity and immunology long before it got popular. 
I, I think the uh, American public in particular has got a whole education on T cells and B cells and what antibodies are. And for those of us, you know, I, I spent my professional career as a rheumatologist, immunologist in, in practice and in, in training. And what, what I think we're really learning, which has been fascinating, we think, you know, everyone can think of that, their heart and the circulatory system or pulmonary. But when the immune system kind of was a little bit, um, as I would say, nebulous for most uh, of the public. And for us, we're really learning that, look at the immune response that we see in different people. Why does a healthy individual who's 40 years old succumb to COVID in three days? Why does someone else who's a child shrugs off COVID, doesn't even have symptoms? So what's different about their immune system, about the way they react? Look at the, look at the very, very spectrum of COVID patients. And then why is it that some COVID patients experience systems long after their acute infection and others don't? So those are all things that are giving us clues to how the immune system is working. You know, people say, well, you don't have any antibodies left, so you're probably not protected. Well, not, not quite. You know, there's things called T-cells that are there as well. But, you know, I, we, we both listen to some of our colleagues even speculate about how long the vaccine's going to work. Well, the answer, the honest answer is we don't know. Right. And, you know, because we don't understand quite precisely how the immune system works and what may be different in one person or another. We've had a number of postpartum mo moms that have had severe COVID. What is it that's different about their immune system that has subject them to, uh, to a more severe disease? But those are the things that uh, I think, you know, we're, we're interested in understanding because they'll have implications for other diseases, right? You know, whether it's cancer or others, once we unlock more of the mysteries of the immune system, it's going to help us with other diseases. Yeah, I think that's um, that's exactly right. You know, if you go back, you know, this issue of, I think, uh, you know, physicians might call them disease journeys. Your disease journey through through COVID, which sounds like a more pleasant than it is, the, the word journey implies <laughs> that you're going to go on vacation or something. Um, but, you know, there's what we found in our analysis of our patient cohort is looking at all the way out to say three or months or so after they've had the, the, the acute stage of the disease is that patients have roughly four different disease journeys. Yeah. And now you can predict early on um, the, the worst of those journeys, which is that their patient's going to succumb to the disease. Yeah. Um, and that's not one of those four, but there's four other ones. You can actually do some measurements and kind of predict where they're going to go. But if you look at, you know, I think everybody's aware from the, from the, just the news that if you're older, you're at elevated risk of, of succumbing to COVID. If you have certain comorbidities, et cetera. However, when we look across these different disease journey, some of which don't look so good, I don't see a correlation with age. I don't see an obvious correlation with comorbidities. Um, it's, it's actually much more mysterious. And, you know, there's a report last week in the New York Times with two identical twins ended up on, you know, very different disease trajectories. Um, and so I think, I think this is going to be one of the great opportunities to really understand how the immune system works in patients, largely because we have a set of tools and we've had amazing patient participation in these studies, like never before. And, you know, we are so grateful for those patients who are continuing to participate. Um, but even going back to the 1918 flu, you had long haulers. Yeah. And, and you look at, you see it in Lyme disease, you see it in other cases where they've always been sort of nebulous diseases that not really quite defined and, you know, take two aspirin, call me in the morning kind of thing. Um, but I think now we might actually start being able to get a handle on it in a way that I would be optimistic it can be clinically actionable, but, um, but I think that it's too early to tell. Yeah, it's going to tell us a lot. You and I have had this question about 
why is it that young children uh, can be asymptomatic, uh, but spread COVID a lot? And we both talked about the fact that they're basic coronavirus factories with the number of colds that they get. Right. The question is, is there, with that exposure and relatively recent immunity, does that make them better able to deal with the, uh, a new infection with COVID where they end up being a carrier, but not symptomatically ill? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a great question. And I mean, there's some early evidence that that's in fact why that's the case, but I think it's really not statistically yeah. as yeah. robust as it will be. Um, so a question that that's, and you touched on a little bit, and it's one of the questions that came out of the audience is, um, you know, we've heard about this variant in England that's yeah. now here. There's a variant in South Africa, I think, that will be here. If it's not here already, I'm sure it's here. Um, and um, and then we also had, you know, the, 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 the variant that dominates the Seattle area, and actually the U.S. in general, is not the initial variant that came here. Right. And so the natural tendency of the virus is to evolve, and typically those that evolution is going to make it more infectious, but perhaps less deadly, but it's going to be jumps and starts. It's not going to be a smooth transition. Um, so do you have any feeling? Um, I mean, that's going to put a shelf life on these vaccines. Sure. Well, I, I think what the real issue is, so in Southern California, you know, we're typing the viruses that we've seen with the explosive growth, you know, and I'm, Glad to report, I just saw the statistics from uh, from LA County and from Orange County. We're finally starting to see that diminution in hospitalizations, but the rates exploded in Southern California way beyond what you might expect from post post holiday, post anything else. And I think we're we're surmising that some of the variants that we've seen in Britain and other places that are more virulent were present in Los Angeles. So it was able to spread faster. And what, what, what has been amazing is from the time the, so one of the variants was described in, in the UK, look how quickly, I mean, it just gives you some appreciation for how fast things spread. And there are no walls to these viruses. I mean, they just go through. But so far, everything that we've seen is that the vaccines that we have today will cover the variants that are out there. We're starting to worry about some of the variants that are in Brazil and South Africa, but so far we can cover it. The problem is it's spreading quickly. So it's easier to pick it up. So we're really under a race for time because this is very akin as Westerners know to forest fires. It, you gotta be able to get in front of it. Otherwise you just can't control it and it keeps going. So that's why so many of us are so anxious about the timeline, because if we can get to 80% of vaccination rates by the summer, you know, by June or July, we stand a much better chance of getting in front of this. Because one of the concerns that uh, a number of scientists have talked about, Jim, right, is that if we don't do that, are we going to have recurrent COVID-19? Are we going to have continued cycles? We can argue a little bit about that. The fact is that once a virus is present, it never quite goes away. Let's look at smallpox, right? Uh, yeah, we've pretty much eradicated it clinically, but it still exists. Uh, COVID will be one of those that we're going to be able to manage, but it never quite will go away in its existence as a virus. But we'll attenuate if we can get a high vaccination rate around the globe. Because again, you know, we talk about the United States, but if there isn't a global vaccination plan that works, you're gonna see cycles and outbreaks like, like what we've seen. So that's why this is such a race to get it done. And as Americans, we should be as interested in what's happening in Africa and Asia as we are what's happening in the United States, because ultimately, Unless you get a worldwide vaccination program, the worry is, is that you'll allow this virus to exist. It'll continue to have variants and mutations. 
and that's going to make it you know more difficult as as we go forward so uh that's why that the timing is so important in terms of what we're seeing and nothing that we're seeing in terms of the variants is surprising i mean it's exactly what we would expect but the good news is that again to emphasize that so far it looks like the vaccines that are going to be in production and are in production now cover cover the gamut yeah i mean i think one of the um one of the things that I don't think we know the answer to this yet, but one would expect that, um, you know, if you vaccinated or if you've had COVID, um, even if the vac if the virus itself mutates its way so that you can be reinfected with a new mutation, probably it won't be nearly as severe. Yeah. Uh, you know, it becomes something that is more like a, a flu. Right. One would guess, um, <laughs> although we don't know that for sure. But I, but I think there's something we said as we talked about the immune system that you've toughened it up a little bit and it kind right. of has so it's not perfect but that your T cells are now recognizing okay I've seen this thing before not quite like it so that you can attenuate the course of it and I think the things that we've learned about COVID are things like viral load make a difference you know your type of exposure how much virus you get. Uh, and then, you know, that it, it speaks a lot of times to how severely ill you, you become or whatnot. So all of those are elements that we're learning a lot about as we go forward. So we think we can at least be able to get it more flu-like as we go instead of what we've been dealing with. Uh, you know, and I can't, you know, I can't come to a conference without saying uh, we've lost 400,000 people in a year. Right. And, and I'm still staggered by that. And it, it is amazing that the first remembrance of that took a year for people to recognize those. And along with that is that we've lost almost 1,500 caregivers, doctors, nurses, nurses' aides in, in this battle. And I, I, I got to say this, I think as a physician and as a healthcare person, it's almost been out of body that this association between the type of battle that we're fighting and the dissonance politically and all around us. And I kind of say it's almost like you're doing doctors without borders. The only problem is the country's the United States. It's not Syria or somewhere else. Right. And, uh, you know, our hope is that we can get the public back on board with us to do some of the things that are basic but make such a big difference because as we're saying, as people get vaccinated, you still can't let down your guard. There's still an issue of being able to spread spread that. So, uh, so we've got a ways to go. You doing the things that we've, you know, I think particularly in the Northwest have done particularly well, but in different parts of the country, we really need to pick up the pace and staying with those things that you've heard a hundred times over to do. We've got to keep doing. So, a, a couple of questions that have come from the audience and I'll, I'll paraphrase them a little bit. Sure. Uh, you know, one is this, you know, Biden has announced this goal of vaccinating a hundred million people in a hundred days, which, um, you know, is quite a stretch beyond what we've managed to do so far. And I think I'm going to twist that a little bit and say, you know, one thing that I've, we've had a pretty fractured response to this virus. I think that, that everybody's aware of that. So can you think of things that, you know, the general population can do to help make this 100 million people in 100 days happen? Well, I, I think 100 million is gonna be achievable. I think what you're hearing today, and as some of our audience might say, is it's gotta be more than that. Because we're getting about, I think we're up around 800,000, we can get, the million mark. But remember, if you do a million a day, that takes you 330 days to get done. Guess what? That's going to be December. Yeah. It's not, it's not good. So I think there's a sense that that sounds good, but not good enough. So what has to happen is that one supply has to be stepped up dramatically. We've talked to the folks in the Biden administration. I talked to one of the folks that's going to be in charge of how we do this. And we've got to have one or two playbooks for the states. Every state can't make this up. We've got to have a playbook. There are things we know 
about vaccine delivery that work. So one, one or two playbooks per state without, you know, let's make it up as we go. And then I believe that you can have each county deciding we're going to do it a little bit different way. Then we've got to attack this in a whole bunch of different ways. We need mass vaccination sites, which are, have to be available with appointments for them. We need to open up all the usual places. Where, where, do, where did I get my flu shot? I got it at CVS. All of that needs to be opened up as, as places. Where people go to their regular doctors, we need to access them and be able to get to them you know, through their normal channels. And then last but not least, we got to look at the big companies. So if I was talking to the CEO of you know, an Amazon or uh, UPS, right, who has all these service workers, they should be having mass vaccination programs for all of their service workers. So we are not going to get, it's not, a, it's not one of these, but we've got to do them all together. Right. The question is, is how do you get enough personnel to deliver the vaccine? We got to get the retired nurses. I, I'm willing to do a shift at three o'clock in the morning. I still have my license. We're going to have to mobilize National Guard folks, retired doctors, retired nurses to jump in and do it. And we just we almost need to take a week or two off as a country once we have enough vaccine and just get this done. But I think we're going to have to attack it with all of these different types of of venues by which you can get vaccine. And then we'll start to kind of move the dial and get it there. But we've been talking about this. This is it's a logistical issue in terms of of, of it. People have asked me why is Britain and Israel doing better than the United States? They have a unified national health system. They can identify where everyone is. They know where people go. So one of the take home messages in in the after COVID world is what have we learned about how inadequate is our response to things like pandemic? And what does the health system, the way it's organized in the United States, need to be a little bit different than it was before, totally decentralized. We have people that don't have health insurance. We have, you know, we, we get care delivered in different ways because we're seeing that countries like Germany or, or uh, Britain or Israel are able to do this a lot easier than we are. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a major, a major issue that we're going to have to face as a country. Um, that I think that it's a discussion that maybe one can begin having now that you probably couldn't have had a year ago. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's just a matter of putting the system to, um, you know, to a stress test. Um, yeah. So I, I one a, a question that had a few votes was uh, someone asked me um, about if I could expand on these four trajectories, these yeah. four yeah. patient journeys. Yeah. Um, so two of them we can associate with people that had rather severe disease. Two of them seem to associate with patients that had mild disease. And, um, and we're looking at the trajectories from when the patients got the disease to about two or three months out. So, by most definitions, this would be long lasting effects of disease. Um, if you look at some of the major inflammation markers, the kind of things that are measured in a hospital, and I don't know how much our audience knows, but um, like interleukin-6 or things like this, um, those are heading down. They're, they're near baseline by, by three months out. But there are a ton of proteins that in many of these patients are extremely high. And these pro and, and in fact, they're going up as you look at these patients. And these proteins are associated with uh, uh, developmental processes like tissue reconstruction. And you take the two cohorts that had mild disease, one of these patients' cohorts appears to be recovering nicely to back to where they were before. The other one is cranking up even though by their COVID score, according to WOS, they're back at, at asymptomatic, there is something going on in the background there. Um, and you look at the two cohorts of patients that had very severe disease, they're also cranking up. You rechallenge these patients with virus you, by taking blood out of their, uh, take, take, take T cells 
out of their out of their blood and challenge them with virus, you would expect to get a memory response yeah. out of most T cells. You wouldn't expect to get an immediate um, if a, a cytotoxic response. But in fact, in one of the cohorts, you get an immediate cytotoxic response, as if there is residual antigen, viral antigen still in those patients. And in some measurements we've done, we actually have found some evidence of residual viral antigen. I don't think there's competent virus, but I think there may be residual viral antigen. Um, and so anyway, we're sorting through all of this. You know, there's a, was, for COVID, you know, we had a, a reasonable roadmap on how patients respond to viral infections that we could have used to interpret COVID with. There's a much shady, shakier roadmap on how patients recover from serious viral infections. That hasn't been studied as much. And so, so we're, you know, trying to piece it together as we go. Um, and, and then we, you know, we're beginning to also look at patients that are, you know, really complaining of long-term symptoms, but, but we're a ways out from having any, any insight into that. Because Jim, you know, when we look at, you know, one of the examples, you know, we didn't have a lot of the technologies we have today. Look at the people that have had post-polio syndromes, right? So we had a group of patients that got polio were able to recover some that had, you know, fairly devastating disease. But then there was a whole cohort of people that had what we call the post-polio syndrome that was essentially, uh, you know, part of a chronic disease and really influenced their, their life as they went forward. So I think now we have better tools to understand who falls into which category. And hopefully, you know, what is it that we can do? So if we can predict that someone's going to have these kind of responses, should they be treated differently with some of the tools and techniques that we have to treat COVID today? And I think that's a question for you, is that once we've identified these different groups, do they merit different treatments either early on or even later on? So in, uh, in you know the example of Lyme disease that you talked about, so Lyme disease, I'm a rheumatologist, so, so rickettsial disease, that sometimes has a short, you know, you get a skin rash, you get a few aches and pains, it goes away. And then there's this extended course of disease. And we've kind of looked at, and you know, you can treat Lyme disease with tetracycline treated early, it goes away. And then the question is, is what else can you treat, treat with it if you've got this prolonged immunologic response and what are the, what are the secrets to that? And I think those are some of the questions that you're looking at, Jim, right? We, we are. And, you know, some things we found and, you know, it just, it, you, 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 this is kind of the thing where you look for it, you find it. And if you didn't look for it, you wouldn't know it was missing. Um, but we looked at a, a huge number of metabolites in the plasma that are lipids involved in cell membranes. They're food metabolites that come from stuff you eat, amino acids, what have you. Um, and there's profound changes in these metabolites. Yep. In fact, profound, profound depletions of these metabolites, almost like starvation level when you get serious disease. But even for all patients, you see very significant changes. And we don't really understand what that means. What it kind of suggests to me is that one could probably supplement pharmacological interventions with non-pharmacological interventions if you could really parse through this. And, but I, I, I mean, it's an, it's a very active area of exploration right now that we don't fully understand. Um, but and, and I, 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 I that will be able to interpret in that, in that light. This is one of those examples that we're talking about data accumulation, that this is the first disease that we've used the power of data, massive amounts of data to get to answers early. I remember, you know, early on in the pandemic, we started calling China up and Italy up to say, okay, what, are, what have you done? But the scientific collaboration, I think is really important to understand. I think that's one of the post COVID things that's gonna be incredible. The way the scientific communities come together, exchanged information, exchange data so that we can understand it faster. And I think we've understood that collaborative science works, right? And uh, you know, Jim, if you're locked up in your lab, but but now you can be infinitely connected with 10 other labs all around the world, 
the exploration, because if, if you look at how quickly we've learned what we've learned about COVID, wow, if we can keep that process going where the scientific community, the clinical community is together, that's going to be incredibly powerful as we go forward in terms of as we, you know, we're going to have other things that we're going to have to solve, but we need the framework that's going to be much stronger than it is today. Because I think there's a lot of scientific isolation uh, that, you know, you're in a lab, you're working on something, there isn't that ability to collaborate as readily. And I think that's been a real difference. During it's been a huge thing, you know, um, and it's the kind of thing that the um, it comes about because of the urgency of a pandemic, but once you have it, you don't want to go back. Yeah. I'll give you a couple of specific examples. So one thing we wanted to do in here in Seattle is to develop a cohort of COVID patients that represent the ethnic demographics of the U.S. And we don't have that here in Seattle. We have a regional ethnic demographics, but we were able to enlist um, uh, folks in Southern California, and we were able to combine our data set virtually and actually in measurement wise with a group in Philadelphia that allowed us to do that. Um, and about a week ago, there's a group at Rockefeller, terrific group, that identified um, a potential autoimmune response in patients that, um, that they think is very important, especially with all these patients hospitalized right now, maybe even actionable. Uh, they reached out to us and we sent them data and we sent them about 50 plasma samples to test their hypothesis. We had ideal set of samples. Um, and so this idea that you can not only um, move data around, but you can actually move, it's only a few microliters of plasma that they need from each of these patients, tiny, tiny amounts. But you, know, you can actually test hypotheses, move crazy fast. It's kind of like a Manhattan project that's self-assembled by the needs of trying to respond to this pandemic. Um, but I tell you, it does not make you want to go back to doing science the old way. Yeah. Um, because the, the, the gain and, and, and this way of doing science is truly ex ex exponential. It's, 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 it's the power of sheer numbers, whether through the, and, and enabled by information technology, and enabled by the fact that when we're analyzing these patients, we can look, we can do thousands of measurements of every single cell that we pull out of this patient's blood. Uh, you know, you simply couldn't have done that uh, a decade ago. And, and I, I think I ditto on just the way we care for the clinical side, right? The way we care for people has that same collaborative network where clinicians, whether they're in Philadelphia, up in Alaska or elsewhere or internationally, all of a sudden are getting together and coming up and trying to come up with answers. That's why if you look at you know, the, the death rates for hospitalization, how dramatically they went down, that was all based on collaboration amongst clinicians. What worked with not using a ventilator? What, you know, how did we know that using methylprednisolone worked? All of a sudden people started using it. We found that you know, that was started in Britain, but we got it here in the States. So I think it's a shining example that, you know, collaborative clinical care and collaborative science are going to make a real difference. And that, to me, will be the one uh, legacy that comes out of, you know, COVID, that we've understood the power of data, the power of collaboration uh, together and how we do that. And that's going to, I think that's going to, you know, be one of the real pluses that we'll have coming out of this. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a question that I think is actually probably pretty relevant for um, uh, a, a lot of people. Um, you know, the I think it's great that the public is actually talking about mRNA viruses now. I mean, that's a that wasn't in the lexicon uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, so um, the question is uh, concerns that um, about the mRNA method of creating a vaccine in contrast to historical methods. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll just make a couple of comments on that. Um, so the mRNA of, method of making vaccines, um, you know, it's, it is new, but it's not crazy new. It wasn't like invented for this pandemic. And in fact, yeah. we were beginning to uh, have a cancer program um, with the Swedish Cancer Institute here 
to use mRNA vaccines for cancer. In fact, they were going to be designed by Ugur Sahin, same guy who, who did the, uh, the Pfizer um, vaccine. Um, and, um, but they were new. It was a brand new technology. And you know, the idea is that you basically get your, the cells to generate the viral fragments in a way that I guess a little more natural in terms of how it would be presented to the immune system and maybe be a little more effective ultimately. And you can stimulate um, the immune response a little bit with things you add with this, with this, with this vaccine. Um, and you're coding it very specifically for those parts of the virus that are most, what do you call, immunogenic and easy to block in terms of, of the effect of the virus. So I think it's an amazing technology. I, I'm, I'm, you know, after it, it really had a kind of a shaky start in cancer, not because of side effects, but because it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it's actually a, a, a real triumph that it worked so well in this case. Yeah. So, and I think it's probably if we are faced with the, you know, we're not going to go back. I think it's, I think this is probably the way vaccines will, will, will happen in the future. Yeah. And, you know, the beauty of this, you know, because people have said, well, what happens if there's a variant that this doesn't work for? The interesting thing is that we can type the new variant and we could probably have a new mRNA uh, vaccine ready relatively quickly. You know, so the beauty of having this technique and knowing it works is that if there is a new COVID, there is something else, this will enable us to get a vaccine ready literally within months, you know, or less. Right. And it's not going to be this arduous process that's there. So it is, a, you know, a safety mechanism for what may be and most likely be another virus that we're going to face. So here's a question on a topic that came um, came up a, a, a little while ago. Um, what um, metrics um, is is Providence System gathering about the efficacy of virtual visits and their effectiveness compared to in-person medical care? What do you? Um, right. What makes you think this is the thing that will stay in balance, as you say, with with in-person visits? Right. So I think we're measuring everything. Right. So we're measuring one. What are the health outcomes, right? So for a cohort of diabetes patients treated virtually, what are we seeing? I think one of the concerns that we've had during the, the pandemic is that people have been reluctant to get care anywhere. And we're gonna see what we have to measure in addition to the deaths from COVID, are we gonna see a spike in deaths from other diseases, cardiovascular, neurogenic diseases? And then we've also been, following the spike in uh, behavioral health disease and, you know, its effect, particularly, you know, with suicide as we go forward. So we're studying all of that to understand where this is going. I think the book is still out. You know, I am going to believe that we'll modulate back to a combination uh, of um, a virtual and non-virtual. Now, the other thing that we've done is started to say, how about hospital at home? Can we take care of someone who would ordinarily be hospitalized and be able to do that with things in the home? So we have a large core of people that we're studying that in, and we're actually looking to see whether those results of taking care of someone with resources in the home give us the same results if they were admitted to the hospital. Obviously, it's not someone who would be in the ICU, but someone else Who's, who's more in that range. That'll have profound implications for what we do in terms of number of hospital beds. And can we can we do care at home better uh, than we were before? So that's something that we're taking a very good, long, hard look at to see how that comes out. So there's a wealth of data. I'm just imploring all of our people to capture all of it because it is really gonna be a roadmap as to how we redesign uh, the health system and the healthcare as we go forward. Cool. So we're at the, um, in fact, we, we just rolled past the top of the hour. So um, I think we should conclude with, um, you know, maybe what are your thoughts about what do we look like in January 20th, 2022? 
Right. I, you know, I, I would include, I am a perennial optimist. I've always ha have, have been, and I, th I think things are going to be better. But there, there are really five factors that are going to affect healthcare of and beyond just what we're dealing with. So the five that I look at is what are the effects on the healthcare system from the financial debacle that we're presently under? What are the effects of other biologic influences that may occur in the future? What about the whole issue of social inequity? Are we going to be able to kind of deal with that in a way, and particularly healthcare inequities, but that whole environment? The fourth that hasn't gotten any attention, but needs to get a lot of attention, is this last year we almost burnt down the Western United States and flooded out the Southeastern United States. The profound effect of the environment and climate change on healthcare and just on our society is something that's not going away. And I think we're gonna see more and more, pro when we were in Portland or Seattle and we couldn't see across the street, I think we got a real taste for how profound the environmental effects on healthcare and on our way of life. And then the last one is the whole political instability issue. Are we going to be able to settle in and come up with a plan for healthcare that covers all Americans? So I, I think the answer to your question, Jim, about uh, 22, I think we'll start to get at some of these issues, but these five areas are so deep and, and it's gonna take us a while. And some experts, and I, I'm in that category, think that this is a five to 10 year journey by which we're gonna move ourselves through this. So that's you know more to come on the healthcare side. We are gonna be very aggressive on the policy side making sure that all Americans get covered by healthcare. One of the things I'll put in a plug in, that I'm doing at the American Hospital Association is my uh, plug for primary healthcare for all Americans. Great primary care for every American, regardless of their ability to pay, that if we had great primary care like they do in other countries, we would have attenuated the COVID-19 pandemic in a different way I don't think we would have lost 400,000 lives. So we're going to push on some things with the administration that we think are doable. Uh, so primary care for all, um, it doesn't sound maybe as good as Medicare for all, but it, from a practical standpoint, it'll do more to save American lives. Rural health care. And then the last one is health care has to be affordable and it has to be available. So uh, let's see how good we do on those. And, Hopefully, uh, you know, when we're in January uh, 2022, we'll be having this conversation and feeling we've moved the dial forward. Yeah. And I, you know, on, from my side, you know, I think one of the big lessons we've learned over the past year scientifically that we touched on tonight was just how much can be done when people cooperate and, and work together. You know, and if we want to vaccinate 250 million people in the next 90 days, let's set, you know, big goals. Um, you know, we're going to have to do that by basically everybody working together. We, yeah. um, and I, and I think people are motivated. I think we just need to have a national plan and orchestration to do that kind of thing. Absolutely. But, but that, that kind of thing would be actually a big start towards great, great. achieving some of these other goals. Great. All right. Thank I want to, this is great fun, Rod. Great. It is. You know, Jim, we could, we could do this for a long time, but I, you know, I, it's, uh, it's fun. I think this uh, intersection of science and healthcare delivery is an important one. And I, that's why I think the two of us, you know, it, it makes a great team. Uh, you know, science shouldn't be off in a lab and healthcare shouldn't exist without the science. And that, that's what makes this fun, Jim. Yeah, let's do this again tomorrow night. Great. All right. <laughs> Take okay. care. Bye-bye.